Good morning, everybody. Bright and early start this morning, but great to see lots of uh, lots of smiling, eager faces popping up on the the Zoom screen there. So it's eight o'clock. So we'll make a, a hard start as we um, we don't have too much time this morning, actually. But um, on behalf of the chamber and our partners, BMET College. Uh, hopefully you can still see me there. The screen went blank for a moment. That was slightly worrying. But yeah, on behalf of the Chamber and BMET College, just wanted to welcome you all to our morning breakfast webinar. Hopefully you've got a cup of coffee and a croissant in front of you. And today we're going to be talking about how do we support the careers of young people through COVID-19 and beyond. Now, this is a, a critical subject at the best of times, I'd say, but it's even more important now with the impact that the coronavirus is having on on education and also the jobs market and if you need any reminder um, of just how uh, concerning things are then the recent unemployment stats for Birmingham I think released um, 10 days or so ago showed that unemployment uh, here in the city is at its highest level since 1989. Um, so what can we do about that and I think that's the aim of of this morning what we're going to look at with our panel. I'm delighted to have with us this morning a fantastic panel actually. We've got Susie branch who's the Employment Engagement Director at our partners BMET College, Fabio Thomas, Project Manager at Beat Freaks, Claire Hatton, who's Head of Skills Delivery at the West Midlands Combined Authority, and Asha Devi, who's Program and Project Management Lead at Arup. So we're going to hear from them all shortly. As we go, please do pop any questions that you have for any of the panelists or all of them in the chat box. And what I'll try to do is um, pull some questions out and put them to the panel once we've heard from them all individually. Um, and I know that, you know, we've only got 45 minutes, so we'll have a hard finish at 8.45 this morning. Any questions which we don't get to, or if there's follow-ups, and I know that the panel will be more than happy to continue to engage and so we'll endeavour to do that and we'll, we'll wrap up with a, a follow-up email after this. Um, just 10 seconds on the Chamber of Commerce, if you're not involved uh, with us or want to find out more then please do reach out to myself or any of my, my colleagues uh, after this. The Chamber fundamentally exists to help and support uh, our business community. Uh, we've got a great team here dedicated to doing just that. Tons of free information for you on our website and social channels. So if you're not engaging already, you're not a member, then please do uh, take a look and find out more and you'll find that incredibly worthwhile. There's a slide going to pop up now which just highlights a few upcoming events. The only one I really wanted to draw your attention to, seeing as we're talking about um, uh, the careers of young people, are the Future Faces Awards, which uh, is our Young Professional Network. Uh, the award ceremonies at the end of August and applications for these are now open, opened yesterday. There's 10 award categories, uh, cross sectors, so something for everybody. And it's a great way for, for young people to put themselves to those who they work with and work for. So please do take a look at that. We'll pop more details in the chat as well, but a great thing to be pushing some, um, some talent that you work with towards. Now we're going to kick things off. Um, with Susie, who's um, Head of uh, Employment Engagement at BMET College, who are partnering with the Chamber on this webinar today. So Susie, do you want to sort of set the scene and give your take on this, this crucial and critical subject? Yes, thanks, Paul. Um, good morning, everybody. And as Paul has said, as a, a sponsor today, I just wanted to take a, a couple of minutes, really, to explain why we're so pleased that we're, we're sponsoring this event. Um, I'm hoping that the couple of minutes that uh, I'm going to have before I hand over to my panel, my very busy home, including my two-year-old son uh, and my uh, army of dogs, will also support and be on best behaviour for the next two minutes. Um, I joined BMET College seven years ago, coming from industry, to start the UK's only professional services academy an academy that was formed by the, the recognition of the skills gap that had developed in the business professional services sector um, because of the actions we all took or, or didn't take perhaps in 2008 and 2009 with the, with the financial crash. And we know, back, looking back to 2008, 2009, that in, in many circumstances, we put a halt on, on training schemes uh, many early talent and, and graduate programs were stopped. 
work experience activity at the time was put on ice and it impacted our young people then deeply. But I think as a city region, we came together when that skills gap became evident. And over the last seven years in particular, you know, I think our regions really led the way in, in how partnerships can be formed between the business community and education, be that schools, universities, FE colleges, be that work experience programs, apprenticeship schemes, talent recruitment, workshops. And you know what, it's, it's, it's really not easy at times to form those partnerships, I know it's not. Um, but in my opinion, nothing worth doing is doing and doing well ever really is easy. And that's why I'm so pleased that we're holding this event today. And I keep calling it a conversation starter. And I think it is just, just a conversation starter. And to hear from our panel in particular, um, on, on the insights and ideas that they might have uh, to help us ensure that we keep this agenda, very, this topic very much at the top of the agenda. Because, you know, as we stand on the brink of an economic crisis and an economic crisis that's predicted to have a significantly negative effect on the impact and impact on the citizens of the youngest city in Europe, a scarring effect on a COVID generation of young people. I know, I can absolutely guarantee that when we come together across this region to face that prospect, all of us in education and business will pause together and say, not on my watch. So it's with that that I'm really looking forward to hearing this morning and to starting that conversation of how we can work together to stop there being a COVID generation in our city. Thanks ever so much for joining us this morning and I'll hand back to Paul. Well, thank you, Susie. That's a, um, that's a great way to, to kick things off. And I think, you know, certainly, you know, yourself and also BMET uh, really embody that, that, that sense of partnership and building relationships. And as you say, it isn't easy and you've got to work hard at it. And I mean, we've seen that, haven't we, in recent times, I think the whole region has, um, has pulled together. We'll hear from Claire shortly, uh, working at the uh, Combined Authority, which in itself is that, that coalition of the willing. And if we hadn't been willing, then it really wouldn't have formed. And we've seen that in other parts of the country. So, you know, there's component parts which are in place for us as a region to come through this. It doesn't have to be, um, that inevitable, or what can seem like inevitable scarring, but we're going to have to work very, very hard at it. But um, thank you, Susie, for kicking us off there. I'm going to move now to Fabio from Beat Freaks. So, Fabio, the, the floor or the, the screen is yours. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, can you all hear me okay? I just want to check. As well. Well, great. Uh, and thanks so much to, to be met in the chamber for inviting us to talk. Um, we're obviously super happy to be here. Um, first, I'll give you a bit of background on myself and who Beat Freaks are, um, and then hopefully we can have a little talk about the topic. Um, so my name is Fabio Thomas. I'm project manager of National Youth Trends at an organization called Beat Freaks, um, born and bred Brummy organization. Um, we're an engagement and insight agency made up of a community of young creatives spread right across the UK. And what we do is we connect brands, government, funders directly with young people so that together um, organizations and young people can sort of influence the way the world works, the way the world um, and the future uh, sort of manifest itself. And the model is, is really simple, right? It's the more that young people have a, a platform to exercise their voices and exercise their influence, the more relevant institutions and, and by proxy sort of the world becomes. What I'm here to talk about today is a piece of research um, which sits under National Youth Trends, which we've just done, um, called Take the Temperature. Uh, it's a report that's just launched and it's a National Youth Trends project, but it is specifically about the impact of coronavirus on the lives and the futures of young people right across the UK. So in order to do the research, we spoke to about 2,000 young people, uh, 14 to 25 year olds we're talking about in this context um, right across the UK, and I'm going to talk you through uh, the five trends which we established um, as part of the report. Uh, National Youth Trends is a holistically focused piece of research. That means like it looks into young people's lives in, in sort of the broadest possible sense. Um, what I'm suppose I'm trying to establish here is that 
in thinking about their career paths, their routes from education into employment, um, unemployment specifically, we need to take in all of these factors when we're thinking about young people. So I'm going to talk broadly about the five trends. The one I'm going to finish with is specifically about education and employment, and then hopefully you'll have some, some questions about it, which is great. Cool. So without further ado, the first trend is called Pass to Remote, and it's all about sort of information, news consumption, compliance in the pandemic. Um, and it's, it's against sort of popular rhetoric about young people, I suppose, that uh, they look to get news information from social media. So we actually found that 80 percent of young people in the pandemic are going to traditional news sources or outlets when when finding information um, about about coronavirus and about its impact. So this is this is stuff like the BBC News app or stuff like NHS Online or the Prime Minister's updates um, directly, as opposed to through social media, as we might expect. More important than this, that one of the one of the sort of key trends that came out was that young people are really, really conscious about the effect of such news consumption, the effect of like news saturation within the pandemic on their mental health. They're really, really conscious about the fact that they were all under so much pressure to stay up to date with what's going on. The impact that that's having on their mental health is really pervasive, and, and they're very, very conscious of this fact. Which leads me on to the second trend, um, which is called lock up and down, and is all about sort of mental health issues. Um, working in the youth sector, um, as, I'm, as I'm sure a lot of you guys will understand, in, we've, we're recently seeing that you know, mental health is, is going to be a trend which isn't just going to define the last couple of years, but in fact, probably a decade or, or two. Um, this, is, this is no different at all in, in lockdown. We see that in light of the pandemic, young people are three times more likely than the national average to be more worried about their mental health. So 65% of young people say they're more worried than they normally would be when compared to only 20% of the national picture. So we see it's having a, a really, really severe impact on our younger generations and more specifically their mental health. One thing I just want to pick up specifically here is that we sort of in a broader context understand the, the strain on young people's mental health generally. This shows that 65% are more worried than they normally would be outside of coronavirus. So we can really see the sort of added value there. It sits, um, and one of, the, one of the main ways young people are dealing with this is by communicating with their friends, by talking to their peers and having that support network, which is often, more often than not, established through school and through, through college and through work. Um, and, and obviously the main way they're connecting with their peers now is through the digital, through the online. So we can see young people are set with a, with a like quite clear predicament or paradox then at the moment in that, they're, they're noticing that news consumption is really, really important to stay in the loop during the pandemic, but it's having a negative impact on their mental health. Their mental health is under massive strain, and the main way that they're helping it is by talking to their friends and communicating with each other. More often than not, the space in which both of those things are done is online. So we can see that young people are really, really conscious of how they're using digital space and how it's simultaneously having a negative effect on their mental health and a positive one at the same time. It's really interesting to sort of think about that in terms of in terms of education and employability in, in that now that schooling has moved online, now that you know onboarding for new jobs and careers and, and finding new work is obviously a, a primarily a digital act. What does that mean for young people's interaction with, with digital platforms um, and finding work online, for example? And then I'm gonna just quickly blitz through to the final couple of trends. Um, all, there's obviously a lot more in the report, so I'd strongly suggest going and having a download and having a read, um, and we're just sort of skipping through things at the moment. But the final couple of trends um, that I think are really, really relevant to this topic, are firstly, the new normal, uh, which is all about social responsibility and volunteering and youth voice. And I think the thing I really, really wanna stress here is that perhaps contrary to popular belief as well, the thing that young people are most worried about during this pandemic is not actually to do with themselves. They're really the top three worries of young people when we ask, you know, what are you most concerned of during the lockdown? They said that the first one was vulnerable people within society. The second was the strain on the NHS. And the third was economic crisis. So we don't see young people looking inwards actually at this time. We see them being really, really conscious about the wider effect this is going to have on society. But they do see this trickle down. So our final trend is times of transition. And, and this is the one that I probably want to hit home, hence I finished on it. Um, but, and it's all about education, work, uh, employment, and the future. And what we see is primarily when talking to young people in education, a huge disparity in experiences. 
more often than not, this is really caused by the fragmented nature of our, our schooling system at the moment, but beyond that in, in universities, etc., we see that some people are, are receiving, you know, massive levels of support, lots of work still, one-to-one um, -one, one -one tuition and teaching, and then some young people are, are, doing, are doing very little. And the effect that this educational disparity, which is going to have on, on this generation, is, is huge. Um, further than that, in, in work and thinking about the future, 60% of our respondents said that they're, they're now feeling much more unsure about their future career paths in light of, in light of coronavirus. It's not a surprising stat, and I feel that now, now that we've moved, moved on a little bit, that number's probably a little bit higher too. And then finally, the thing I think that's probably most worth stressing, which I'm sure you'll all be anticipating, is that this, this pandemic is hitting those who are at a time of transition in their lives hardest. So those, those young people who are 16, 18, and 21, either moving into the next stage of their education, moving into their world of work for the first time, or moving into higher education, it's those people who are entering a new stage of their life, who, who is, I mean, it's a difficult thing to do at the best of times, as, as Paul mentioned at the start, how does that look in coronavirus now? And um, and yeah, I think so. I think that is that's probably the 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 point. If if you're going to take one home, that would be it. So to briefly sum up, um, as I'm sure we're running out of time, uh, I, in spite of you know overwhelming compliance to government advice, um, and overwhelming sort of mental health pressures they're they're facing and uncertainty about about the future, young people are really really keen to play like an active social role within the pandemic. They really want to contribute. They really want to participate. They really want to help um, key workers, uh, and they they're volunteering. They're doing social action. In spite of this, young people haven't really been offered a seat at the table building this sort of new normal which we're looking to establish. So what does that look like? The final stat I'm going to leave you with is that. In light of the pandemic, 92% of young people across the UK feel that this moment could be a chance to make a positive change for society. 92%, an overwhelming majority, thinks that now is the time to stop, pause, and think about how we can move forward. That's what I want to leave you with. How can we make changes now when we've got the chance, when we're reflecting, to make positive changes for young people? Thanks very much, and look forward to hearing your questions. Fabio, thank you so much for that. That was. Um you know, high octane. And, and I think one of the thing and fascinating, you know, one of the, the key things about Beat Freaks as well is that you, know, you really, you know, dig deep, don't you? And get in amongst it. Lots of people are talking about young people and what young people think or want. And what, you know, Beat Freaks do is actually evidence it and uh, show what the, the, the true reality is. So I know there's been a couple of comments um, just around take the temperature and national youth trends. And if you get a chance, I don't know if you'd pop a link in the chat so people awesome. could, uh, can access that. that. Um, the Brum Youth, Youth Trends report that, that Beat Freaks have done for a few years. Uh, I know at the Chamber we've been delighted to support and partner up, but it's a fantastic organisation. And if you don't know much about Beat Freaks uh, yet, I'm sure Fabio's whetted your appetite, um, <laughs> but please do, because it's, it's growing onto a national stage, but, you know, born and bred and um, got that heart, beating heart here in Birmingham. But, um, and I think that there's a good message of hope there at the end, you know, the amount, despite the challenges, the amazing, incredible, uh, amount of challenges just that 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 sort of sense of optimism and wanting to make a positive difference that that young people have and as you say not looking inward uh, but actually thinking how do we use this as a, a chance to make a positive change so um thanks fabio so we're going to shift now to claire who is the head of skills delivery at the west midlands combined authority so claire over to you Morning, thank you Paul and thank you Susie for asking me to join um, this morning. I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of um, the combined authority perspective of, of where we, we see the um, issues currently, the emerging issues and um, a bit of a, a, a top line on the, um, on, the, on the plan we published last week and our ask of government in terms of what we think we need for the region. Um, I'm going to start with the stat as well. So, so reflecting on um, what I was going to say today, when I started this job two years ago, um, we did a lot of work with the mayor around what he termed the wicked problem of youth unemployment. Um, he always talked about um, it, it was a complex problem, it was a shared problem, and that um, the concern in the region was that youth unemployment had stayed stubbornly at around 14,000 uh, young people. When I saw the stats last week from, um, from DWP and I look across the region now and we are talking about 44,000 young unemployed um, people. 
in the region. And in Birmingham and Solihull Hill alone, that figure is at close to 17,000. And I think two years ago, we were talking about a wiki problem across the whole of the West Midlands at 14,000. So that's just to give you an idea of the scale of the challenge. Um, so, so we know that young people are going to be hardest hit um, as part of this crisis. All the reports you read um, tell you that, all the evidence, previous recessions stack, stacks up against that. Um, we've got a younger than average population in the West Midlands, often something we celebrate when we talk about Commonwealth Games, City of Culture. We talk about our youth and our diversity, but we know young people and people from, from Black um, and other ethnic backgrounds are more hard hit. Um, it, you know, through, through crises and through um, recession as well. So that gives us a real issue. We know the number of entry level jobs and apprenticeships and graduate jobs are falling and are probably going to continue to fall. Um, and Fabio touched on this. We know that lots of people are already experiencing exclusion from learning. There are lots of our young people who, due to digital poverty, not necessarily digital skills, but lack of devices, lack of Wi Fi, you know, lack of. Um, a home environment or another environment to be able to study in. We talk to our colleges and, and they reckon that around about a third of their young people are already disengaging for, for those type of reasons. So when you look at the number of young people already engaged, plus the disengagement that's happening, that's a really kind of scary statistic for us um, in terms of, of, of what we're going to do. Um, I think just to summarise a couple of the really key challenges for us um, across the region that um, nobody really owns young people who are unemployed and their support. Uh, Fabio talked about transition points, but we know that we know the 16 and we know the 18 year old transition, but, but young unemployed people have a number of transitions, maybe in and out of employment, in and out of different support services. And every time they're passed from one person to another and explaining their story again, that can be a really demoralizing and difficult experience. And when we talk to young people, we know that transition is the, is the, the biggest point of weakness in our system, whatever that transition is. Um, and careers guidance is really limited um, in the region, really limited. If you're not in school or in college, um, you know, accessing the careers advice there, where do you go as a young person if you're not signed on with, with DWP? There isn't the, the career service anymore, there isn't the guidance, and there isn't anybody owning every young person to make sure everybody is, is supported and looked after. So I guess that's a bit of a summary of the, of the, of the challenges as we see them. Um, so in terms of our proposals and um, what we are asking of government, um, the first proposal, and I probably should say each of these are multi-layered and, and there's a lot of things in there, so I'm gonna kind of give you the edited highlights, but the first proposal is to make sure we can track and engage all young people at risk. So it, it's critically important for anyone who's not in education or not in work that they can access the independent advice and support they need to either help them find a job, get them a place at college, at university, on an apprenticeship, etc. Um, and making sure that we can offer that to every single young person um, across the region, regardless of their situation. Um, we also think we need new training and education products to, ref to reflect the changing needs. So at the moment, a lot of young people, there's full-time courses, or there's apprenticeships. We know apprenticeships are hugely popular, but equally we know that apprenticeship numbers are, are falling massively in terms of opportunities and starts, and they are falling faster and harder for those from disadvantaged backgrounds. So whilst we might not be able to provide those at the moment, we do need new products that are not necessarily year-long full-time courses, that may be six-month courses that are more occupationally relevant, give people the skills and help them um, gain something while they while they wait out the time until until opportunities do start to arise again. So we're working really closely with all of our 21 FE colleges across the region about how we can how we can design and deliver um, you know different programs for young people to keep them engaged because the worry is a lot of people will sign up for college because there isn't anything else to do. It's not really for them and by Christmas, as well as a youth unemployment issue, we will have a huge spike in our neat numbers across the region. So we want to make sure we've got really relevant products as well and really high quality work experience. So if there aren't jobs there, at least young people are getting really good work experience that they can put on their CV. 
Um, and finally, our other big ask is um, around incentivising employers to take on young people. We know it's a difficult economic market, but we but we truly believe that um, employers still need to be able to take a chance on young people. But we are asking government for an incentive um, to employers who take on um, apprentices to help them with the cost of that at this time. So. I think lots of things in there, and I say lots of things um, covered, but I guess I guess my my thing to leave you with is not only are we talking about 44,000 rather than 14,000 young people, but the one bit that the combined authority, no amount of money or no amount of um, powers can make us do is the employer angle. And that's really, really critical for young people. They want an opportunity, that they want a job, they want an apprenticeship. So for all those employers in the room, I, I would ask that, that even in these difficult times, you think about young people and how you might be able to provide that for them. Thank, Thank you, you, Claire. Thank you. I think that's a really fair ask, isn't it? And Susie touched on uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the sort of economic crash in 08 and 09. And it is crucial that, that businesses think back and remember some of the lessons. It's different circumstances now, without a doubt, but at the same time, investing in talent, investing in young people is critical because as we recover and bounce back, you need to have those skills, that energy, um, and the future in your workforce. So they do go hand in glove. And, and Claire mentioned the, uh, the submission that the Combined Authority have put into government. This is coming ahead of what's been labelled the fiscal event um, at the start of next week. I'm going to pop a link in the chat, which if you follow it through, then you'll see uh, there's a way you can go online and sort of show your support for this submission. And we're putting an appeal out this week for as many businesses and organisations to do so, just to send the message to government that the whole of the West Midlands is behind this, a little bit of weight of numbers. So um, if you do get a moment to uh, to click on that, it's really simple to do. That would be much appreciated by, by everybody. Great, well, thank you, Claire. And now I'm gonna move on to our final uh, panelists. Please do keep your questions coming in the chat and we'll try to grab a couple of those uh, before we finish. But handing over now to Asha from uh, Arup and Asha heads up program and project management. I know Arup do an awful lot around graduate recruitment and, um, and apprentices as well. So looking forward to hearing from you, Asha. Thank you, Paul. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, I just want to say that I, I actually take a role in the education sector in, in Europe in the Midlands. So I, I, I know Susie and many others because of the role I play in, in delivering education projects. And um, it really sort of beds us into schools, um, higher education and further education. So we see quite an interesting perspective from the different educational institutions that exist in and around the West Midlands and the wider the wider Midlands region. Um, I think certainly hearing everything that Fabio said, and Susie said, and Claire, it, it, I'm sort of responding a little bit to some of that, but not necessarily answering all the questions, but certainly a perspective from an employer in the region. And we are a large employer, um, you know, we're circa 900 staff, and um, we sometimes struggle to get local um, young people to apply for roles in our organisation. So we've taken an active challenge to change that. And we've put together a team that is specifically liaising with the various groups and communities and education institutions to really sort of say, it's not just the traditional school and careers fairs, there are other routes for us to actually engage and, and find candidates who, who are local to the patch, who want to come work in an organisation like Arab. So, so I would say that, um, wholeheartedly agree, agree with Claire that we need to do more around how we engage young people into programs and as they're in their transitions um, stages how do we access them and, and it's almost a plea from from an employer in the region to say we we find that we we want to do more but we sometimes struggle with the time frames we have and the accessibility so there's always room for improvement and, and we're we're very keen to do more. We're very keen to link up with more groups as well. So um, uh, as an employer, I would say, you know, sometimes we probably need feeding a little bit of information around what's going on in the market. Uh, and certainly an opportunity like this to hear you all is great for me, from my perspective. So thank you for that. Um, I think there's a few things that I would like to sort of say. I'll talk a little bit about the programme that Arab does. I'll talk a little bit about, about how it's um, being adjusted under COVID. And, um, and what our commitment is to young people 
who are coming into our business in particular. Um, we have an early careers program, it's quite extensive. Uh, typically, for our office here in the Midlands, we would be taking anything between 20 to 40 graduates every year in September, and we take circa 20 to 30 apprentices each year as well. So our numbers tend to be within that range. Uh, I think this year it's it's a little bit lower, but it's it's within the 20 to 40 range. Um, in a in a bumpy year, it'd be 40. In a in a slightly more stable year, it'd probably be 30. So this year we are still taking our um, graduates and apprentices. We've delayed taking them um, by a couple of months because we need to be back in the office in order to then help them to settle in and get them engaged. Uh, we, we felt it was too difficult to um, bring them in in September and then find that we haven't actually reopened the office or haven't got enough staff in the office. So we've committed to their employment and we're um, starting to ramp them up from home uh, with a view that they'll come into the office later in the year. Um, and I think that there's many employers who, who are making that sort of commitment to their graduates and apprentices. We have a very structured learning program for, for our um, young people. We tend to put them through everything from a design school through to um, an engagement program with other graduates or apprentices and a mentoring program. And we haven't really mentioned the word mentoring, but we specifically do a, a, a very well-organized mentoring program from within the company. And quite often we will encourage them as they settle into their first year to start to engage with people from outside of our company with, you know, with architectural practices, with contractors we might be working with, with client organisations. So it's very much a hand in hand as an employer is, is still supporting them through the mentoring stages as well. Um, you've mentioned the future faces. I'm pleased to say that we're putting quite a few uh, people through into that. We find that's a great way to encourage young people who've entered into our business to, to really sort of put themselves forward and say, you know, I'm working in Arup and, and, the, and the fantastic jobs and the work they do, we, we want that to be reflected to others as well. Um, I think interns, we also have quite a few of them each year in the summer, and it's been difficult this year because we're not in the in office, but our commitment to interns remains. And one of the things that we do with interns is we make sure we pay them. And I think that's an important part of the process. So when you look at some of the inner city areas, um, getting young people from inner city areas to come and work for us we prefer a couple of months in the summer from them but we recognize it needs to be a paid role and I think that's something I would say to other employers is you know interns we shouldn't see them as a free resource they are they are an important resource to us they are the kind of individuals that we would want to employ longer term so I would say you know look after your interns and certainly for us we you know, disappointing we haven't been able to have them this summer, but we we remain very committed to them. And some of our interns actually like to come in and take a sabbatical or have a module they can take in the winter months. So we, we continue to support and we take quite a few on each year. And uh, one thing I will say about apprentices is that we tend to um, have different types of apprentices. And I think one is on this call today from, from my team. We encourage them if they want to go on and do a university course. Um, we will encourage them to get themselves through professional chartership programs as well. It doesn't just end at the end of a two year program for us. It actually leads them on their career path to the next stages. So we will we will support apprentices and, 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 and get them to wherever they want to get to. And quite often our apprentices want to be degree qualified want to be chartered professionals and we we certainly encourage that and i would say an apprentice a fear that some of the apprentices have uh, that we've come across is that it's just a two-year program and then after that they're on their own the answer is as an employer we need to take them on that journey all the way through um, and certainly that's an important part for, for us as arup and, and and many others i'm sure who are on this call um, we also do an awareness week in engineering, and I'd like to plug this a little bit if I can. We, we invite 14 to 17 year olds specifically to come in and do a week in our offices, and we do about 200 a year. We haven't done it this year because we, you know, with, we're still engaging with the schools program, but we recognize we can't do that this year, but we will continue with this program next year. 
And um, we also do an under fives um, afternoon activity in the office. We let, we let under fives, uh, t- up to 20 of them come into the office. It's, it's quite an interesting day when we do that. But, but many of our offices are keen to really start engaging with young people very young and we find the under fives really enjoy and are fascinated what you can make with spaghetti um, and then it moves into the the older year groups but the 14 to 17 year olds can actually come in and spend a week in the office and, and we tend to group them so that there's about 20 of them at the same time in our office so they can actually get to know each other as well and it's about building their networks and it's encouraging that and I would say the 14 to 17 year old age group does get left out a little bit. And, and these are the ones who don't necessarily have, you know, the school support, won't necessarily be moving into sixth form or a college, um, but want something that they can, you know, associate themselves with in terms of a type of employer that they would aspire to be with. Um, so whilst we're a professional consultancy, we recognise we've got to bring people from all walks of life in. It's that variety that makes us who we are and it's what our success is based on. So I would say that that's an important part for us. Um, and then we do a number of structured schools. Excuse me, I have hay fever today. Um, and we, we do a, a, a series of structured design schools. And whilst we're not doing the design festival this year, I think that there are lots of programs around the city uh, and I would encourage us all to link up with them. Um, You know, the pop-up studios that were done at the Custom Factory for the last two years have been really successful for us and parents and young people have come in and and spoken with us and everything from virtual reality modelling through to building a 10 metre spanning bridge in paper. Um, I, I think it is about showing them that there are lots of opportunities in, in STEM subjects in particular, and uh, we could do with, uh, and it's an appeal to employers as well, let's do more. Let's do more around showing our, our grassroots, if you like, in the West Midlands, you know, the engineering, the industrial era, um, the manufacturing capability. Uh, we, we certainly find the more structured programs we do, the more um, interest we have from the community, especially young people. And, and the idea of being able to use coding in maths and engineering is something that we want to try and promote more. We talk a lot about the gaming industry. We don't necessarily talk about all the 3D modeling that's fundamental to the way we design buildings and design everything now. You know, everything is based around 3D modeling. So again, it's, it's opportunities that we have as employers and we'd love to hear from more young people. Asha, thank you very much. I think. Um... I love the idea of what you're doing there for the under fives. If I've got two who are just slightly older than that now, but they, they love building stuff, be it Brio or Lego, and you can see how do you, you tap into it. If I could uh, send them off to the Arab campus for maybe about um, the next 12 weeks, that would be great. Um, but, I mean, Arab really are a, um, an enlightened employer. Uh, it's employee-owned, actually. Many people may not, may not know that. But there's some great examples of best practice there and, and how do we do more. There's a few comments in the... Um, in the chat, I know Jane at, at BNP Paribas um, mentioned that as well. I think that's one of the challenges around yeah. skills. It's a sort of ongoing conversation. I'm sure lots of us have been on on similar um, sort of events. But I always think from the business community, there is a willingness there. Quite often, though, it's just how do we um, pull it all together? And certainly colleges, I know, you know, um, where Jane is in, in Solihull, uh, it's got a great college there. And, you know, obviously we're here with BMET today and um, sort of pretty spectacular individuals such as Susie are key for sort of convening that and putting it together and, and making more sense of what is a complex landscape. But um, again, I do think that the willingness is there and certainly from the Chamber's point of view, we're happy to try to play our part in bridging things as well. Um, now, we are really short of time, as we said at the start. I mean, this is uh, just a, a sort of a moosh bouche really, to uh, this discussion because you, know, you could talk for forever around it. There was one, there's a great um, early uh, sort of comment and question from David Wokes, who's talking about the concept of short courses. Uh, he was involved in the past in the Black Country Consortium Skills Factory, where, where they focused on a more mature workforce and upskilling them. But could the question, I guess, is could this sort of scheme be reestablished? with FE colleges to ensure that young people can be ready to go into the, the work world. So I guess sort of like a, a relatively short and snappy uh, sort of program there. I don't know if anyone wants to 
just touch on that as a starter or, or Susie indeed? Yeah, um, I, I agree, David, and um, we have a longer model of that around the Professional Services Academy, whereby we, for, for the two, one to two years that the students are with us at BMET, we, we in essence, through our partnership across the sector, working with people like BMP Paribas, we wrap two years worth of work experience programmes uh, around uh, the students so that they get the opportunity to develop, um, I don't call them soft skills anymore, I call them vital skills. So there's those, those vital skills that we need in employment, be that how to work as a team, presentation skills, etc. But I think where we are in COVID and for somebody with, with perhaps um, a personality like mine who, who always thinks of a glass half full uh, and is always looking for opportunity, I think one of the opportunities that we have in education now um, because of where we find ourselves in COVID is the ability to start to look at product development and innovation. Um, and we, in some cases, we need to turn to, to the likes of our partnerships with the combined authority um, or other parts of, of government to ask for support on that in terms of flexibilities around funding, etc. Um, but it, it, for us as educationalists, it's for us to take a step back and start to think about how we can evolve our products very much like Claire was saying, to, to meet the different needs. And in, and in fact, particularly around adult engagement, that is something that we are actively doing at the moment at, at, at BMET. Um, and, and in essence, always trying to do with, with engagement for young people. Thanks, Susie. I don't know if anyone else just had wanted to comment on that or any particular thoughts. No, I mean, what I'm going to do, Susie, I mean, just, um, I just had another comment from Victoria as well, just flagging Uprising, um, brilliant organisation. Um, and some of their employability program as well. So again, Uprising, if you're not aware of it, then, then please do check them out. Very active um, in and around Birmingham as well. Um, and certainly a great way of empowering young people um, and sort of giving them that the, the platform and the confidence and knitting it an awful lot uh, in with some of the, the leading regional employers as well. So thank you for that, Victoria. Susie, you know, it's nearly 8.45 already. I don't know if there's any closing thoughts from you just before I, I wrap up what you've heard today. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, I mean, when we sort of came together this morning, but also came together to work on this event, I've always been trying to see this as a, as a start of a conversation um, to see how we can rebuild or continue to build on, on the work that we mentioned earlier that, yeah, everybody in education and business has been doing as i say whether that's schools whether that's fe colleges whether that's independent training um, um, institutions whether that's a, uh, he uh, uh, institutions and i think you know when i when i look across this virtual room today there's there's over 74 of us here uh, at eight o'clock in the morning to discuss how we can try and not have a covid generation and how we can try and stop that scarring effect with those statistics that Claire gave us, we know that that is not going to be, be easy at all. I think with ASHA has given us uh, a room for thought of how we can, we can create, be a bit more creative. And I think when we come back to what Fabio and, and the Beat Freaks report shows us is, for me, this isn't just about a, a short term work experience program of how we, we can support young people and, and, and about just getting them into work. We have to think about the significant impact that there could be on the mental health of young people in our city region if we don't proactively try and support each other through this. So my, my challenge, I suppose, to us all is, you know, as I say, there's over 70 of us in the room today. Perhaps if, if the start of the conversation is we all just agree to be the innovator or the challenger in our organisations, and, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a senior position, maybe next time you're sitting around the board table, you might challenge the CFO before he just perhaps takes a, a certain line out of the, of the budget for next year. Or maybe speak to the HR team and say, actually, I know we, we're saying we can't do work experience this year, but what can we do that allows us to, to still engage um, and, and provide young people with, with opportunities to, to help through this, this career. Because as I said at the beginning, I know from all of my experience in working in, the, in this partnership way for the last seven years, if there's one region that can come together and do this, I know it's our region. 
Thanks, Paul. Well, thank you, Susie, and thank you to uh, to BMET for for partnering with us on this this webinar today. I think it's a great challenge to end this. I know that we'll 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 pick up as well because this is just a a starting point. The response has been great, so thank you everyone for for joining. But as always, it's around what are the outcomes and what can we do to drive this forward. So I'm sure Susie, you and I will will have a uh, get our heads together and think about some follow up just from today. Um, but one thing that's certainly clear is that you know we're really going to uh, crack this and to ensure there isn't scarring from COVID on on our, our younger populations, and we're going to have to do it together, aren't we? No yeah. one organisation or uh, can ever crack this tough, tough nut on their own. And I think it is that spirit of collaboration which is going to be crucial. And you know, certainly half of the chamber will you know, more than willing to and will step up and continue to to play our part. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, and a massive thanks to our, our panel for some, some really fascinating insights. So Fabio, Asha, Claire, thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure we'll give them all a big virtual round of applause. Um, enjoy your rest of your day, everybody. I think we're just about at 8.45 exactly, uh, just as promised. And we will follow up with a, a note out to you. There's been lots of links in the chat, but hopefully if you've got any follow-up questions for us, or you've missed anything, then please do reach out to myself and my colleagues. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.